Welcome to Women Winning Divorce. I am your host, Heather Quick. I am an attorney, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Florida Women's Law Group, the only divorce firm for women by women. I love thinking big, thinking outside the box, creating creative solutions for women, and empowering women to win in all aspects of their life. Our approach at Florida Women's Law Group is to provide women with a strategy to not only achieve their objectives, but win at life. I believe that what may show up as adversity is simply an opportunity to change and improve your life. In each episode, I sit down with innovative professionals and leaders who are focused on how you can be your best self before, during, and after divorce. In these conversations, we are looking at how women can win at life. I have the unique opportunity to meet women when they are at a transition period of life, but that is only the beginning to becoming your best self and winning at life on your terms. With our guests, we enjoy the opportunity to explore ways all women can win and enhance their life, no matter where they are in their journey, because divorce is just a point in life, not the end and not what defines you, rather a catalyst for your growth. Welcome to today's episode of Women Winning Divorce. I'm Heather Quick, owner and attorney of Florida Women's Law Group. This week, we have something a little bit different. We're going to be answering some frequently asked questions, questions from our Facebook group and listeners' questions. So today, I'm joined by Olivia Dodd. She is our podcast producer as well as our marketing assistant. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm excited to be here, be on a different side of the podcast recording today. Well, I am so glad to have you because you are always here, but you are (laughs) not always on camera and audio. So I am glad that you get to pose some questions to me today. Yes, me too. All right, let's get into it if you are ready. Absolutely. And, you know, let's touch on as many things as we can today. And hopefully this will be so helpful to our listeners who are maybe ready, but still have a lot of lingering questions about the process or for our listeners who aren't quite ready yet, but this might help them make some decisions. So why don't you get started? All right. Little extra nudge you might need. All right. Let's get right into it. I think kind of the first question that most people have is what is the process? What is kind of a basic overview of the divorce process here in Florida? Like what are maybe the major milestones? So the first major milestone is really making that decision that you're ready to proceed forward with the divorce. Because I would say that's probably what takes the longest, right? That's years in the making um, for for most women. And so that's the first step. And then you really need to uh, hire an attorney, educate yourself so that uh, you can protect yourself and your family. And once you hire an attorney, and we have several episodes and and resources on that to guide people and women on, on the best practices on how to find the right attorney for you, you're, you know, the, I would say we divide it up if you want to look at it in three parts. So a lot of it is in the beginning, it seems like you're doing a lot, but it's moving slowly because you've got to file. And that's what I would say is the discovery process, which is just basically the financials. And it's a time consuming process because you have 30 days to answer things. Some days you have a little longer on some things and then same with your husband. They have 30 days. So before you know it, truly four months has gone by. It's right. changing. So that's like the first part. Mediation is another milestone and that really happens in the middle. And, and for the majority of clients that tends to be the end if they're able to come to an agreement. And then there's that last part, which is the trial. So, you know, and that is a period of, I would say 12 to 18 months is average. Of course, it can be faster, but um, that's a realistic expectation on time. Perfect. That was, you answered my next question. How long does it typically take? So does it take shorter or longer depending on different factors? Or maybe people want to ask, how can I make this quick? Is, Is there really an answer for that? Or are there things that people can do to make it move along faster? There. Yes, there is not, our state doesn't require a period of separation or require a, you know, you've got to be, you can't be divorced, you know, unless you 
waited six months after filing. So there's no legal requirement. I would say if you and your husband are on the same page in, in agreement, that can absolutely um, speed up the process. Um, but a lot of it, you know, is still, I think it's worth while thinking about this um, because, you know, many times, like I said earlier, you've been thinking about the horse for years. Well, um, but regardless, let's say it took you eight years in a marriage to get here to our spot, to the divorce attorney. And now you're like, I want this done like yesterday. Well, <laughs> right. it, took eight, it took you eight years to get to where you are now within this marriage. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to guarantee because there are other factors, but it's not going to take you eight years to get out of it, but it's probably going to take more than 30 days. And because there's just a lot to it, um, it's usually worth it to do, you know, you have to do certain steps in the right way. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it that's important. Um, slower, you know, and it's not that you're slowing it down, but the more complex case, mm -hmm. you know, we talked in other episodes about really complex litigation and trying to I you know define that. But if there's a business that would need to be uh, appraised and evaluated, mm -hmm. that is just by its very nature going to take longer. If there is um, you know a real dispute on time sharing and mm -hmm. you know, children, again, that because you're going to bring in other experts, which are necessary, usually based on the fact it, it's just going to take longer. Right. Right. Yeah. I was going to say you took, you took my point. Um, I, I think that when you bring in the experts, that's where I feel like I personally see it really linked in the process. Um, so you mentioned earlier about filing and you have time frames to adhere to when filing. Does it matter who is filing first? Is there an advantage or a disadvantage? Can you walk us through that? Yes, I can. Now, in you will hear if you listen to other attorneys or read things that it doesn't matter. And I I would disagree a little bit because um, one, you're you're prepared ahead of time, so you've had the benefit of preparing with your attorney before your spouse is aware. Right. Um, and then when you file. Um, when it's time to go to trial, you get to, pr you get to go first. Oh. So for those of us who like to be first, those <laughs> like a competitive one like myself, yes. uh, the firstborns, um, that, that's why. And, and that, you know, overall, sometimes that truly is an advantage to put your case forward first. Now it's just an advantage. For, it can be for so many reasons. I do not want any of our listeners to think that for the court, they look at anybody differently. It's not true. Right. And this is a no fault state. So if you didn't file and you're responding, they're not going to look upon you better. And they're not, and if you filed any worse. So from a standpoint, there just may be some things and based on your facts and circumstances, it's in your best interest to have more time to prepare and strategy and then filing kind of by the time your husband gets served and we file, you are feeling so confident and you have all your ducks in a row because you've spent the two months prior right. working with your legal team. So that would be why. Um, and it's a generalization, but that can be a reason why it, it can be important. And, you know, if you just want to wait to be served, um, I would ask, I would tell our listeners, why don't you ask yourself why? What are you just waiting for? And why are you being passive in this situation? It just may tell you something about yourself that maybe you should work through with your, your therapist. Um, maybe that's what you've done in the marriage and he's always taken action and you're like, I'm going to make him do it. And I find you know, from these years of talking to women and um, they can be really unhappy. And I'll give an extreme example. You know, your husband's cheating on you. He just comes and goes as he pleases. You're doing all the day-to-day, -day, everything, mm -hmm. right? Taking mm -hmm. care of the house, the kids, probably even his laundry, his dry cleaning, whatever. <laughs> it's like, what would have his motivation be? He's got everything he wants. He's very happy. He's very content. And it would be more of a uh, inconvenience for him 
to do that. So I think it's just really questioning why. And, right. and, and there's a lot of reasons that are so specific just to you. And only in emergency situations, generally, would we say this is you need to proceed first. But I think it's just a better question internally just to kind of help yourself grow and understand the process as to why, if you've made up your mind, you want to do this, why now are you going to just sit and wait, which is just like, you know, waiting for the other shoe to drop. And it can really feel like things are going backwards when you do that. Exactly. Why not now is maybe the yeah. the more uh, important and effective question to ask. So you said that Florida, here in Florida for our listeners, you said that we are a no fault state. Can you kind of explain to us what that means and how maybe that will look different in other states who are kind of looking at whose fault it is? Yes, and the biggest thing is that in to break it down to just like if you just are done, you're done, and you don't have to have a reason. <laughs> right. And I know, like we we do many times within ourselves, and and we've done episodes on that when you're like, he's still a nice guy, right? And but yet I'm just I'm, I'm over it, uh, you know, for for whatever. You don't have to have a reason. Okay. You really don't legally right to, for the law there is no requirement and that's important because that's really you know i know we've we've gone backwards in our laws as far as you know the protection of women and mm-hmm. women's rights but mm-hmm. i would say this is when it evolved to no fault it was really to say listen because it used to be you know as a white you you would have to prove he did something wrong in order to divorce him Wow. Um, men didn't need to do that, but women did, of course, right? And so, <laughs> um, you know, so that's part of why it, it allows you more freedom, okay. right? You can, you are free to divorce. You don't have to prove bad acts. Now, various states can have um, things that may not be necessary to prove for a divorce, but it may impact things such as alimony uh, and, and the time sharing with the children that probably would certainly be a cause for divorce. And, right. you know, and recently the law in Florida changed that infidelity mm-hmm. can be a relevant factor. So it's not for the purpose of fault, but it could, you know, have some bearing on how the financial support is handled. And that will be more, we'll, we'll table that for a later day because the law is going <laughs> to evolve over the next few years. And I'm sure we will see a lot of interesting uh, case law on that, I imagine. But overall, you don't have to prove someone's a bad person. And, you know, many times our clients over the years, they say, oh, wait till the judge hears about this. Well, really, we're probably not going to tell the judge about that. So <laughs> maybe if we can find a way that makes it relevant. Yeah, exactly. You know, and probative to the issues. But generally speaking, we don't have to go in and trash him. Uh, for you to be able to get divorced. You may want to, but it's it, it really removes that from the the proceeding because it's <laughs> right. And I, I'm really excited in, in future episodes to kind of see how those new Florida law changes um, appear in the courts. So we've talked about the timeline, we've talked about the milestones, we've talked about, is it advantageous for you to file first? I think this last question is a juicy one. People always ask us this. By the time it's all said and done, what is this costing me? Mm -hmm. Well, um, what there is, there is a, um, a saying, you know, whatever it is, it's worth it. But, um, (laughs) <laughs> the and, and usually so, but that is going to be a sliding scale because if if we go to court a lot, if there are a lot of issues and it's just maybe you and your spouse have a high conflict right. relationship, um, and we have episodes on that. Um, you know, but if you listen to them and you identify yourself as that, okay, you may be looking at six figures. Um, and, and it really does come down to that. And it's usually probably pretty equal on both sides. Um, it's okay. That's at the high end. Right. Right. You right. have just six figure divorces that are not your everyday divorce. Right. And I would say for for the majority of our clients, we're looking at $25,000. And 
that's a maybe on the high end, but it's better to really be prepared. And I guess the better way to think about it is in relation to the issues, right? Okay, right. so let's talk about issues. If there's money issues, if there's issues with the children, mm -hmm. and then how agreeable or disagreeable are you and your spouse? Right. Because the more issues and the more disagreeable the two of you are, right. the more expensive it's going to be. So just keep adding zeros um, with that. <laughs> And, and, you know, some, so many people actually really come to terms and, and can agree. And then we're looking at, you know, $10,000, but, um, and, and yes, it's been less and, you know, it, it's a hard one to say, which I know can be very frustrating, of course, but a lot depends on you as the client and your spouse. And, and I think it really does. It's really important, I think, to know what you're getting into. I think sometimes that there's kind of the shocking realization of, oh, is that really what it's going to cost me? Um, so I think sometimes maybe that is motivation to like, hey, figure it out. Leave your leave your battle in the past and maybe, you know, don't bring it into. And or listen to your attorney. Mm -hmm. Good um, point. <laughs> many times, many times clients don't listen to us. Or they do the, I'm going to do it and I'm going to, you know, ask for forgiveness rather than permission. And, and some things kind of, not kind of, that then you go to court, it can, it can be extremely costly. And now where you got to go in and we're trying to repair your image and those things with the court in order to achieve your goals. So yeah, a lot goes into play of that. And, and most individuals, you know, they're like, it's not my fault. And it's not about fault. It's just the reality. And if your husband's right. really difficult and refusing to cooperate, it's going to cost more. Right. Exactly. But again, it doesn't mean you don't go forward. Um, it, it's just, it is what it is. And it's not, it's very, very rarely completely one-sided, but it can. Of course. I think now is a perfect time for us to take a break. All right. All right, listeners, if you would just take a minute to leave us a glowing five-star review, we'd really appreciate it. That way other people can find us here at Women Winning Divorce. We'll be right back. We are back from our break. And again today, I'm answering some frequently asked questions for our clients and listeners. So this time, Olivia, our producer and marketing assistant, is leading the interview and she is asking me questions about divorce and family law. So Olivia, take it away. What is oh, next? Thank you. We're going to be answering some children and child related frequently asked questions. Um, so, you know, we love to talk about relevant and current things on here. If you've been following us for a little bit, um, something that's going on right now, or at least at the time of our recording, um, is international time sharing. So right now there is uh, Sophie Turner and Joe Jonas. She's taking legal action to have her children with her in the UK while he is obviously here in the United States. How would you handle something like this when you you and your ex are maybe living states or even countries apart? How, how do you handle time sharing in that way? So one of the biggest factors is going to be where do the two of you reside as a family? So let's say that, and I don't know, I'm, I'm behind on following um, Sophie Turner and Joe Jonas. So I don't know where they live and, and maybe they both went back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just say for the purposes of this for our listeners so let's say you guys have, that you have a residence in florida and a residence in another state or in a different country you typically identify one as your primary residence right now in florida let's say we do that for purposes of homestead and tax reasons okay so there are many people who live here you know, six months in a day and then somewhere else <laughs> yes. to say that they, so they can benefit from the laws of Florida. And that's the kind of different other facts and information that would be brought in. Because in that situation where we're going between states or countries, that's going to be the first one. Where is it really proper to bring this action? Okay. And what evidence do we have on that? And we have had a lot, many cases, where in between states, 
um, in, in regards to children, but even if you don't have children, you, you need to know what is the correct state that we should be filing for divorce. And so you have to, you know, make sure you've explained that to your attorney and they've asked enough questions because many times, you know, I've had that circumstance and I said, no, you, you ought not file in Florida. And even if we do, and we maybe had a chance of winning, like say, let's just say it's 50, 50, I'd probably say it's like 50. If I said no, I'd probably say it was 55. You know, it'd be more on the other <laughs> side that we would lose. Right. But, you know, that's just you're going to lose a lot of time and money um, litigating in the wrong spot. And that's like, you know, law school 101 that we all took the civil procedure and jurisdiction. And, but it, it can be complex. It's not that simple. So anybody who has those things, that's really the first thing that comes into play because then once you're talking children and particularly another country, mm -hmm. a lot is going to come into play with that. And if you start really um, applying the hate convention and if you get yourself in front of a judge and they think you've left the country um, and you shouldn't have, you can really suffer some ramifications that depending on in what courts and how it's portrayed can really... Um, you know, detriment, be detrimental to your relationship with your children. Um, so it's important that if that's your situation, you are meeting with an attorney early and provide full disclosure mm -hmm. on why maybe your spouse in another country or in another state might think that that's the right place to file or initiate the action because it just the fighting over it can last a long time and you haven't even started moving forward on the actual divorce. Right. I don't know if that answers it, but it's really complex. So that's another episode for us to have uh, in our international time sharing. You know, it's, it's not like you guys can be doing the, the 50, 50 in that situation. Um, but speaking of international, because of where we are geographically, we're in Jacksonville, Florida, we have two military bases here. What if your ex-spouse or soon to be ex-spouse is being deployed to a foreign country? Do you guys use the agreement that you've maybe already talked about or do you have to go back and modify your agreement how what would that look like again um not a simple right you know one word answer so if the divorce is already over mm -hmm, you're going to have to abide by your parenting plan and the law has evolved that the the parent who's deployed they can um to maybe substitute their parents for their time sharing when generally you can't do that because right. there are no grandparent rights in the state of Florida but there are instances where you can preserve that most of the time that would be anticipated and if you but many times um, I've seen a lot of divorced you know folks that were divorced in the military and they didn't get attorneys and it's a hot mess afterwards um, if you have kids or property you didn't have an attorney the first time. It's just a mess. And it's going to cost you twice as much the second time. And particularly as it relates to parenting issues, you should have anticipated this and right. planned for how you were going to do it if you were divorcing at that time. If you did it, um, obviously it's not the time to modify because he's going to be out of the country. And depending on, you know, what kind of deployment, there may be limits to um, actually uh getting in touch with him and serving him. And there are laws on that, like the active service members, right? Like if he's an active duty, you can't initiate the action. Mm -hmm. Like they're protected from service of lawsuits, which includes divorce. So if you know it's coming and he's going to be deployed, you better get it done now. <laughs> he still may have it. He still may have it stayed, but at least you filed. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I'm not saying that's definitely you need to do that either way. You may really you should really speak with an attorney without a doubt and understand hey what would be the best strategy mm -hmm. based on the things that i want again it comes down to really what you want but then also what are your circumstances because the you know when the spouse is in another country usually there are provisions that you you know prepared for that um and if you know, things nobody's complying in any way that can be difficult as well. 
Of course. And so what about this simpler kind of example? What if you guys are living just states apart? How does that work? Is there some sort of from afar time sharing plan that you can put in place or how does that work? Yes. Well, we have in um, in Florida, in most jurisdictions, you know, we all have guidelines, right? That's mm -hmm. what courts are going to kind of refer to as the basics. And if you have no idea what you want, and you're just asking the judge to decide, they're just going to do these standard guidelines. Right. And we have long distance guidelines. And most often, generally, it's um, you still split the holidays um, and or alternate the holidays. And then it's usually the summer. So, um, you know, they'll get them all summer if they only see them at like Christmas and spring break. So, and, you know, that's as far as they can, for a simple answer, that is the guideline on that. And, and you know, a lot of things come into play in that as far as travel, mm -hmm. how are the children getting transported? What, you know, what's the cost of that and things of that nature, which are really important because, you know, you ideally want to have a plan and an agreement that lasts you as long as of course. Possible, you're not always having to return to court for clarification. <laughs> Of course. We, uh, we spoke in a couple episodes ago with Megan Hunter about frequent filers. That doesn't sound very fun to me. <laughs> no, and, and it's definitely, um, yeah, and it's hard on, on the other parent when the other one, it's like every time they disagree, they, they file. Them. Of course, of course. And so I think backtracking a little bit, how do you get used to sharing your children 50-50 if you guys are in the same area and you are in that kind of mile radius that dictates the 50-50? How do you get used to that? You know, I really, um, I know it's got to be hard. Sure. Um, I, when I, when my parents were divorced, we did like maybe every other weekend, you know, and mm -hmm. we did the holidays. And I know it was difficult with my mother. Um, I think there were some times when she was like, good, I'm glad you guys are leaving for, you know, a few days. <laughs> but um, I, I know it was difficult. And I think really what it's so important to really recognize that children do need both parents. Mm -hmm. They really do. And you may not like him anymore, but your kids, I mean, he's part of them, right? And so they do need both parents for all their differences and different parenting styles and routines. It's really helpful. And, you know, if you know it's going to be that, try to get a schedule that fits your family. Mm -hmm. I know some uh, women, some clients have been like, you know, week on, week off is perfect. Some are like, no, that's too long. We got to split the week or my kids need this or that. And I think that's the key. You've got to really think them about them and hopefully, you know, really work, really, really work to maintain a decent relationship with your ex-husband because you guys still need to communicate about kids and, um, and really find things for yourself, friends, activities, stuff to really occupy your time. And help you grow as an individual. Use that time wisely so that you can really, you know, work on becoming better yourself. And maybe it's within your career. You're like, all right, when when they're on here, I can really put in those extra hours and build build on my career or if I can work out more or whatever it is <laughs> that, you know, you want. Take a class. Do things to help you become a better individual separate from your children. I know will help. Of course. Yeah, definitely use that time um, to your advantage. And I think the other side of that question is, what if there is a strained relationship with between your children and your ex or soon to be ex, and they don't like the time sharing agreement? How do you handle that? Or is the court going to take into account, you know, I don't want to go to my mom's, I don't want to go to my dad's, how would that be treated? Boy, that gets really complicated, because underlying are some serious issues. Something's going on. Right, right. Um, and, you know, the initial approach or, you know, the standard thing is, well, they're children, they got to do what you say, right? Well, I mean, there comes a point where they don't. Um, and yeah, of course. Point where they start voicing their own opinions. And, um, and it's hard because you don't know what's going on in that other house. 
So I think you need to really um, inquire and I would absolutely involve a therapist in this because something's going on either at your house or at their house that is leading to this or something at school. Your, your child is suffering somewhere with something. Our world is so complex. There is so much information. There is so much. And I think it's really, really hard for children these days. Um, you know, with all the social media, everything at school, the pressures that many of them may put on themselves or feel that if they don't want to do this, um, I would take it seriously and not in a blame, but really try to figure that out. And unfortunately, like the older they are, like once they're getting an adolescent, they may not share with you. And so that's why I said, you know, get a therapist involved. Mm -hmm. You, you know, the, the law, you don't need to get consent. Go take them to a therapist and say, listen, if you don't want to talk to me about what's going on, here's a safe place, but you've got to talk to somebody. Um, depending on your relationship with your ex, you may or may not be able to have that conversation with them. Right. Um, you know, I, I think most parents will take that personally and demand that the child comes rather than give them space mm -hmm. and say, hey, let's get to the bottom of this. Um, because, you, you know, that's, really the best solution. Um, and, and many times I think it can be, it's obviously something going on at either one of the houses and or school, but whatever it is, it's, it's, it's difficult for your child because they do want to please. And they generally, most children want to see both parents, you know, um, it could be another relationship that's going on. Um, and they don't want to go because they don't want to be around this new person mm -hmm. because they don't know how to feel about it, right? I'm not saying that that person has done anything to them. Although I do know when your parents have new love interests, they act differently. And so as children, you get kind of annoyed because you're not <laughs> a priority anymore. So, and, and it can be a whole, it can run the gamut. And I would say that you ought to get help because if you're going to come to our office and tell that, tell us that, I'm going to say, you got to go get help. Like this child needs to talk to a therapist because we need to find out what's going on or are they just being manipulative, which is normal teenage behavior. It doesn't mean anything's wrong with your child. Um, so yeah, I think it, those are serious things and you can end up as being portrayed as the cause of this if you're not careful. Um, if you're the one who they're telling you, I don't wanna go over there. You gotta, you gotta really inquire and investigate. And definitely seek legal advice, advice before, you know, something detrimental happens. Exactly. I think something that we say in our office, at least, uh, well, the three days that I'm here, at least go to therapy, <laughs> get a therapist. I feel like we we're such proponents of that. We say that so often. Um, and, it's, and it is important. And your children need to feel safe and need to have some place to go. Of course. And then, you know, because as parents, we worry something horrific is going on, right? I mean, well, okay, I say the I get me. I go to <laughs> you. Anyway, right? My mind goes to, oh my God, it's being horrible. Yes. Well, as parents know, if you take your child to therapist, they are mandatory reporters. So if something horrific exactly. has been happening, they're going to report it. Like, you know, and so to me, it, that way, and then maybe at the very least, they just need to vent and talk and work through their own feelings. They're, you know, they're just a child. Of course. To figure that out. Yeah, and they're part of the process too. I mean, I'm sure it's really emotionally difficult um, to see, you know, your parents be married and then not be married. I'm sure that's extremely difficult. Um, this is a perfect time for us to take our second break. Um, listeners, if you will please leave us a review and let us know which episode has been most helpful for you so far, we'd appreciate it. We'll be right back. We are back from our last break. And if you are just catching us now, please go back and listen to the first part of the series. We answered a lot of great questions. And um, we talked about the divorce process and time sharing and then just some, you know, miscellaneous things that are outside of the box too. Um, but there's more, of course, um, questions that, you know, we've received that we want to try to answer because 
so often, you know, if you're the listeners, you're thinking, oh, wait, that was exactly what's going on in my case. So, Olivia, take it away. All right. Thank you. Particularly in my corner, what I do for Florida Women's Law Group, I'm on our social media all the time, right? Um, so in my corner of social media, I see a lot of questions surrounding child support. And the one that I see several times a week is, hey, my ex, you know, makes all this crazy exorbitant amounts of money, but he only pays me, you know, $150 in, in child support a month. How, how is that determined? And can you request to be paid more? And how does that work? Why, why is it, why does it look so disproportional um, from the questions that, that I see sometimes? Okay, that, that requires several answers. Many times, in the initial divorce, you knew money was all that mattered to him and you agreed for him to pay less just to be done. Interesting. Our clients don't always recall that, but they were done and they knew that was a big issue. And unfortunately, sometimes they give them more time in exchange for that. So what you see directly related in Florida is the amount of overnights that each parent has directly, directly affects the amount of child support they're going to pay. So that that's where it stems from. Okay. And so you have to go back to the original calculations. How were those done? What were they based upon? And if you believe based on what you observe, which is money being spent like crazy, mm -hmm. you're thinking, how is this possible? I should be getting more money. Um, then that's where you do have to go back and, and modify it and dig into the financials. Usually they then are going to respond with wanting to modify time sharing and have more time. Um, it's just uh, that seems like that shouldn't require a law degree because that's like the easiest thing. It's just what they do, whether or not there's a basis for it or not. Um, but, and that's why for our women listeners, I mean, men are very predictable and, and frankly, so, so are women in this process. We see the same patterns over and over again. So the only way to get to it, you know, is if you agreed in the divorce settlement to exchange tax returns and W-2s every year, which just is a little tip, is a good thing to do because then you can run the calculations, call your attorney and be like, it's worth it. It's not worth it. Right. But that's, you have to go back to court. Have to go back to court. <laughs> Again. Frequent filers is uh, yes. what we what we like that to say. That one's worth it. I would call that frequent filers because that's that. Money's always that. I think. True. That was that's uh, interesting that you say that people just want to be finished with it and they accept maybe not exactly what they wanted. That's a really and interesting. Just people, women do it all the time. That's like really one of the bases for why I started this firm because women just are so easily, so ready to give up without recognizing that the long term effects of these sacrifices for what you think you're compromising to make him nicer to you it never happens that is certainly true and that is a perfect segue maybe you're finished and maybe you are ready to be through the process maybe you're wanting to date someone new how does i know this is a juicy question we love this one um Will the court be able to take into account that you are maybe seeing other people in the process or past the process, or does that hurt you in the process particularly? So, I mean, here in Northeast Florida, it's still the old South, and yes. And will it hurt women? Yes. Will it hurt men? No. And that's just the way it is. We That's the way they're going to look at it. Um, with children involved, you, you just really, you should be very mindful. And if you're dating when you, you don't have your children, that's great. And I would suggest you not, you know, make any social media or any dating thing very public. You want to keep that um, to a minimum. Um, you know, we've had different um, experts on the show and they're like, dating's great. Uh, you know, I'm looking at it from a strategic point. Mm -hmm. so if you're our client, we already know your situation, who your judge is and what the issues are. And I mean, you know, that's another one. Most people are like going to, you know, ask for forgiveness, not permission. Um, but I would say, no, you're very vulnerable and you need to heal yourself just from a mental health perspective. But if depending on 
what the issues are in your case would influence that. And so you may say, well, my kids are grown. It's fine. Okay. Well, is alimony a big deal in this case? Mm -hmm. um, that may cloud your judgment and you're jumping into a relationship. And here we're going to advocate and get you alimony. And, and, and I mean, I guess if you fall in love and get married again, that, that should be wonderful, but um, we shouldn't spend a lot of money on, <laughs> on your alimony case if, if you foresee that in your future. So I don't know. I think some judges would absolutely do this anyway. Um, and that I absolutely. And so, and you know, even if the judge didn't view it negatively, if you've been dating and anything comes up that your spouse is aware and then they're going to question you on it, how is that going to make you feel? How are you going to feel like airing, you know, your private, um, relationship with someone else now and it may or may not be relevant but think of that because like when we're in when you're in a force everything's under the microscope and can take and be taken so out of context mm -hmm. and used in so many different ways that just it's a short period of time in your, the whole grand scheme of things and you're probably going to be healthier afterwards if you would just wait <laughs> <laughs> that that is i think that is a very attorney answer but um Yes, we, we have. Had I mean, it's better than a flat out no. Right, right. right. I mean, that's really what I want to say, but <laughs> I know there's some reasons behind there. I know, I know, I know. Um, and you mentioned in that response about social media and kind of your private life and your private relationships. How do you feel about people posting about their divorce process on social media? I mean, what, what would you say to our listeners that maybe kind of have that urge that they that they want to? Well, I think it's in very poor taste. And I think that um, if you aspire to have some class and some banners, don't do it. If you don't care about that, go ahead. But, you know, I I really think social media should just be for pretty pictures and you know, <laughs> things you want to show off. I, I really think you ought to kind of take a hiatus from it when you are in the divorce process. Um, very, I have not seen anything good come of it. Nobody ever is like, oh, look at these great family pictures on social media. It, it just really hasn't. And, you know, it's just out there for all to see. And you may be like, oh, that was just a mistake. And, I, you know, <laughs> so nothing good, ever, nothing good ever comes. Like, just like, you know, my mom said, nothing good happens after midnight. Well, <laughs> nothing good happens by posting crazy things on social media. Yes, yes, very. I feel like that's in the same vein as nothing good happens after midnight. Um, so can it be used against you? Is that something that you would maybe oh, absolutely. use? Absolutely. Like, um, you know, yeah, I mean, if there's pictures, it, it depends, right? Like, it really does. But let's say alcohol is an issue. Mm hmm. Or somebody wants to make alcohol an issue. Mm -hmm. And you have all these girls nights, fun nights out, pictures with drinks. And it seems so innocent. But maybe there's some other stuff behind the scenes. Or your your husband has something to say. Like It could really back. It could really be yeah. embarrassing for you. Embarrassing for one. Um, how much weight and how relevant it would be. It would depend. But... Um, you may be in a situation where you're really embarrassed and you're answering questions that you feel you shouldn't have to. And often when clients, you know, if I have the opportunity or if they're listening before this, I'm like, before you go do it, just think about how you want to answer those questions on this stand in front of a judge. Honestly, because you're not supposed to lie, right? Like I'm not right. advocating you're going to lie. So if you don't think you can answer that question, in front of a judge with your husband, all these attorneys, you know, everybody looking at you, then probably you shouldn't do it. Right. It's like a read your note in front of the front of the class. Yeah. If if you don't think your grandma would want to see you doing it, don't take a picture. That is that is very sound advice. And I think that I will be clipping that and using that as our quote for the day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one of our last questions that I've got for you, and maybe this does pertain to pictures and social media battle, and he said, she said, recently in Florida, where we, we've had a change and we're now able to consider infidelity in alimony specifically, 
if you are wanting to do that, what would be your strategy to kind of prove? Like, are you using bank statements? What do you, what exactly as an attorney are you using to make that argument? Okay, I think definitely financial records okay. are going to be the best. Um, you know, those ring cameras can come in handy. So <laughs> you might want to think about those. Um, so any picture evidence and, you know, the things on your phones, um, I, I'm not saying, you know, some people share like plans and devices and, and people can get really in a lot of trouble if there's an iPad linked to their iPad. Uh-oh, and all the of iPad. Sudden, yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> it's in a lot of trouble. And that evidence can be used. Photos, text messages, recordings, things. Um, so those would be some things. I mean, sometimes, you know, we've certainly had private investigators. Um, not to the extent, like, in the movies, right? It, it, not for me, okay? We haven't had anybody <laughs> in through windows taking pictures. Right. Um, but I guess you could. I, I don't know. We've we've definitely had people followed in, in pictures and, and make reports. So yeah, uh, you know, and that's where it's like weighing. Okay, how how much how much am I getting out of this? If I'm right. This, you know, and and that's not necessarily a known fact. So it's weighing all of those things. It's like okay, so if we prove this, what likely are we going to get out of it? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people are like, well, I'm going to get satisfaction. I'm like, well, that's a lot of money. For what you believe to be satisfaction, which may not, and um, so you know the money trail is usually the easiest. Okay. And, and if it's a substantial amount of money, because money and infidelity and money, you know, has always been something we could use to show that um, you know the money wasn't used for marital purposes. So therefore, you you know you should be entitled to that back. But you know, as now it relates to a factor of alimony. Um, I think that if the money trail was significant enough and we felt like it was, uh, we would probably look to see what other kind of evidence, but that may be harder to get once the divorce process has started. So, um, and I certainly have had clients in the past um, who had hired a private investigator on their own. Yes, I think what you said about satisfaction, it sounds like an expensive way to be satisfied, but hey, if that's that is your journey. That's um, journey. And that's why I like consulting a lawyer maybe before, because yes. the private investigator, that's their job. They don't necessarily maybe know what, how it'll help you, but they're like, oh, I'll get you all kinds of stuff. And then you may be really disappointed when you, you bring all that to your lawyer and you spent like $10,000. And and we're like, I don't know if we're really going to be able to use this. And, and if we did, like, what are we going to then show with that, right? Like, what's the end result? that we're going to get. So I, I say talk to an attorney to see if, you know, what I believe to be true. And if I hired somebody to prove it, how could that help us in court? Right. And would there ever be a situation where you think a private investigator would be advantageous, like aside from the infidelity? Would you ever recommend using one for oh, a different yeah. situation? Um, absolutely. Uh, many times, um, a lot of times with like substance abuse mm -hmm. um, and and maybe just overall like bad behavior and moral behavior that you might say and it it have to be pretty you know I don't know how it would affect the time sharing you know but you know drugs alcohol things like that yes it can be it can be helpful um, and. You know, really, if you think they're hiding money, the private investigator isn't the way to go. You really need a forensic accountant. Mm -hmm, of course. What, what type of, you know, bank stuff, you know, going that route. Um, and, you know, I, I'm trying to think. We used to have one, like, because, oh, with alimony, if you cohabitate. So if you're living with somebody, there's there's a lot of steps and factors in that mm -hmm. to um, terminate alimony and so that might be a case where private investigators trying to get some information on that relationship by pictures or video how, how often they're living together or spending time together so those are some of those types of examples where it may be helpful perfect well i think that that is a great way for us to end our frequently asked questions episode today well, we really appreciate it. And for our listeners, if you or someone you know is going through a divorce or is thinking about a divorce, of course, reach out to us at 
Also, please join our Facebook group, Women Winning Divorce. The link will be below in the episode description. And also, we are hiring, so please check out our opening to Florida Women's Law Group website career section. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode, I would so appreciate you leaving us a five-star review. And thank you for listening. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Women Winning Divorce. My goal is to elevate your life and the way you are thinking so that you are best equipped to win at life. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe so you automatically get my new shows every week. And I would love to hear from you personally. Come join the conversation on social and join our Facebook group, Women Winning Divorce. We welcome your comments and suggestions. We want to bring you content that helps move your life forward. Women Winning Divorce is the place for an elevated conversation on how women can thrive during times of adversity in order to live their best life.